Hello, Politics Plus Media 101 listeners from around the world. Today, we have a great show for you in store with Chris Steyerwald. He's currently with American Enterprise Institute and News Nation and is formerly Fox News political director. He has testified in front of the January 6th committee uh, and is responsible in large part for Fox News making the call in Arizona in 2020 that President Biden had won the state. So he drew the ire from Trump and the MAGA movement. On today's show, we will get into the MAGA movement. We will get into the House of Representatives and most obviously the results from midterms. So we will be off this coming Thursday. So in two days from now, because it is Thanksgiving. So we will see you again about a week from now. Happy Thanksgiving, folks. And in the meantime, enjoy the World Cup. So good afternoon, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Great to be with you guys. Did you have your eye on your former employer, Fox News, during any of this recent election cycle? And if so, how do you think they did? I did not. I'm sorry to say, or I don't, I'm sorry or not sorry. I was, I was not able to watch Fox's coverage because I was covering. Well, what about in the uh, weeks and months leading up to the election? I, d- I did not see a lot of their cover. I don't watch a lot of, t- I don't watch a lot of TV and I certainly d- don't watch a lot of cable news or TV news. I remember when I was working in TV, I'd seen shows about the making of TV before I worked for TV. And there was this British comedy show called Episodes where a British family, they moved to the U.S., they're in Hollywood, and they are they can't believe how American TV works. And one of the reasons is that the heads of the network tell them, oh, we don't even watch TV at all. We haven't seen your show. We're giving you notes in the show, but we didn't watch it. And I was thinking, how could that possibly be real? It's It's impossible to believe that people who work in TV don't watch TV. And then when I started working in TV, I realized that it actually was true. <laughs> well, I think te- I think television news has real value for people who have limited amount of time to consume news. And I think television news uh, has a lot of appeal for people who have way too much time. I'm not who TV news is for. I consume a lot of news and information every day. But I can see how somebody would want the idea that in 30 minutes that you could get a good primer with video and that if you were wanted to basically stay informed, I can see why somebody would want to watch Brett Baer or Jake Tapper or somebody to get a, a download on what's going on. Like, that makes sense. It's just not where, it's just not, that, that's not the world where I live. So, Chris, can you tell us about what your media diet is then? You know, you talked about how you don't watch, but you read a lot of stuff. I mean, who are your go-tos? Are there columnists? Are there newspapers, magazines? Well, I mean, again, I'm not a normal, I'm not, I am not a normal, I'm no one to emulate, but i subscribe to a lot of newspapers uh, and re- I read a lot of newspapers. And I, I think there's a citizenship diet. Uh, and I, this is what I tried to talk about in Broken News. As I do what I do, I try to bear in mind somebody who, and I have a, a theoretical person, he lives in French Lake, Indiana. He owns uh, a Ace True Value hardware store that he and his family run. He is, wants to be engaged but he is busy. And so I always try to not waste his time. My fictitious consumer, he doesn't need to be led on any wild goose chases. He doesn't need to be um, sucked into the minutia. Um, I think even ordinary news consumers should be subscribed to at least one high quality national newspaper. You have a, a wide range of options. That includes both the New York Times and the uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, WAPO. I think basically it's like if you if you want to be basically up to speed, you need to subscribe to one of those two papers, probably. Uh, then you need something else or a couple other something some things else. Uh, as a contributing editor at the Dispatch, I would say think about subscribing to the Dispatch. It's wonderful, and we make your uh, inbox smell like cinnamon. But you need something else. And then, of course, what else do you need? Most importantly, local. You have to be paying. You have to be subscribed to local news. So I saw the other day that the Disney Plus bundle or the Hulu, whatever the bundle was like, oh, it's going to be $82 a month now. So we are well accustomed to paying for content, but we have to be accustomed to paying for news content, which has been something that has been unreliably and useful, but reliably free uh, for a while. So there's a getting, getting used to that aspect. 
So you mentioned that you're uh, working with the dispatch. I listened to the remnant that you were recently on with Jonah Goldberg. And this will be the last media question before we pivot, take a hard pivot into the election stuff. But how long does it take you to prepare for election night on News Nation? It's sort of like the SAT. You're, if you're not prepared, you can't cram for it. You're getting prepared as you go, and the primaries help you get ready because you've got to you know, break everything back down, get out your almanac of American politics, break everything back down, go through uh, the great Nate Moore, my research assistant at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, feeds my brain. Uh, but you're, you're doing it as you go. And then when you get ready for the final push, a lot of it is organizational and a lot of it is knowing which races in what places and filling up a recipe box with five by eight cards uh, with key races on them and all the little habituations and superstitions uh, that you develop over decades when you're doing election nights. Uh, those those things are included. Though I did, for the first time in a long time, miss out on having Bit O Honey, uh, which is uh, a, for, since you guys are young, it is a candy that is universally hated by people under age 100. But Bit O Honey, which is like, a, it, it tastes like Honey Nut Cheerios. There's like a nutty honeyness to it. But it's a it's a hard to chew taffy. Uh, I'm a big fan, and this year I, I I let myself down. I let the country down, and did not have a bag of bitter honey for my election night. So I'm sorry. Being from the Northeast, your description reminds me of Moxie soda, which I don't know if you've had. Uh, I love it. Yep, I'm a big fan, big fan of Moxie. Well, but if we're if we're talking about New England and bad candy, what are we really talking about? We're talking about Necco wafers. We're talking about the why. The why, why? And did you know that Necco Wafers used to be the business project for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's business school? Really? Necco stands for New England Candy Company. And they ended up, I don't know whether it was created for them or given to them or however it ended up that that was what you did for your senior project. You ran the New England Candy Company and you were you could do anything you wanted, but you could not change the product. Because the terrible, terrible product, which is basically a sugar communion wafer uh, flavored with a weird sort of burnt anise kind of disgustingness that only <laughs> during the Cleveland presidency would somebody have been like, I don't know, kids, that was a pretty good uh, communion wafer with a little anise flavor. Mm. <laughs> I'm just down the road from MIT right now as we're recording this here in Cambridge, so... Uh... I'll pass the word along to them next time. I'm no, they know it's bad. They don't think it's good. They're not like, <laughs> ooh, we've done it again. Nobody ever ate like a whatchamacallit and then had a, a Necco wafer and said, I don't know, the latter. <laughs> and then you said French Lick and not to get canceled, but it made me think of the hick from French Lick, which, as everybody knows, is Larry Bird, That's right. one of the greatest Celtics of ever. And who was his name ripped off from? That's a good question. So the hit from French Lick was the successor to Zeke from Cabin Creek, who was Jerry West from Cabin Creek, West Virginia. Oh, I did not know that. A little bit of Celtics. Exactly. Uh, lanky, thievery there. La lanky white guys uh, as uh, being nicknamed for their hillbilly appellation. Yes. And it's totally fine today, and especially in the liberal media. I doubt they would bad an eye. But um, I do want to get into what you kind of understood to be the key takeaways here from this election because a ton of people were wrong. So let's start out with what actually met your expectations. Well, I think the important thing everybody should take away from this election was that I was right. <laughs> and I think that's what America should focus on. And you were right because of your priors. Is that correct? I was right because I did not get sucked into the wish casting and fear casting that happened at the end. So. One of the things that I know is that good polls are pretty good and have been pretty good. There are serious problems with state-level polling. That's just true. And I take all state-level polling with serious salt. You can use state-level polling to figure out what's the direction of the race, but you can sort of also ignore the top line. So you can tell whether a race is closing or what, what's going on with the direction of the race, but what's the top line? I don't know. Like, it's just hard. State-level polling, for a lot of reasons, is hard. But national polls, especially national polls of Democrats, have been very good, right? And, and polling, if you limit yourself to high-quality polls. Now, this is hard, because in the closing days of an election, there are no high-quality polls. All of the high-quality polls have already been done 
because no one's polling the weekend before the election. So everybody's sitting around refreshing uh, 538 and Real Clear Politics looking for anything. And the data that come in late is going to be of poor quality and it's going to be vastly overinterpreted. If you took an average of a good average of the generic congressional ballot, it was predictive. It's pretty predictive. Uh, it's going to be off by a half a point or a point when we get every vote counted. But it, w- it will have it will have not only been predictive, but it will have pointed to what we got, which is a very small Republican advantage. And is it going to be two point two points or whatever? But it, it, it was it was roughly correct. And I said there's going to the Republicans are going to get between fifteen and twenty five seats in the House, and I I landed on R fifty one, but of course saying uh, fifty fifty is and by the way R fifty two so just about as likely. So the Senate we knew would be in the Senate we could express a higher degree of certitude. Uh, about a about a small range of outcomes in the House, there was a broader range of outcomes, and the Republicans did miss on the low side. It's going to be I don't know what are they going to get? They're going to get thirteen net something something like that. So I said fifteen. So I was a little more I was a, I was, a, I was a little more optimistic for them than it turned out to be. But everybody was afraid. And so all the mainstream, most of the mainstream and Democrats, abetted by Democrats in this, that they polls are going to be wrong again. I'm like, well, they weren't that wrong last time. No, they're going to be wrong again. And how are they going to be wrong? They're going to undercount Republicans massively, and that's going to be what happens. R plus three. Right. It's worth three extra points. And I did find out, by the way, that the the median uh, understatement of Republican performance in 2006, 2010, 2014, 2018, uh, was 1.7 points. The polls are always wrong. We just don't know in which direction and by how much. So, for example, in 2012, the polls were wrong. Actually, the polls were more wrong in 2012 than they were in 2016. But they were wrong in against the Democrats. They understated the Democrats, especially in Florida. There was not a national soul searching that went play, went up because Obama was projected to win. He won by more than he was projected to win by. And he won in places, particularly Florida, where he had not been expected to win. This was all like discount. But in 2016, where the polls were, the error in the polling in 2016 nationally was less than it was, again, I have to keep saying, using good polls. You can't just take the real clear politics average. But if you rely on good polls, the performance in 2016 was better than it was in 2012. But what was the difference? The expected thing, which is that Hillary Clinton was going to win, did not occur. Instead, it, they hit, uh, she hit on the low end of her side and Trump hit on the high end of his side, like two sine waves crossing at just the right moment, just the right frequency. Donald Trump won. He was at the high end of his register. She was at the lower end of hers. Thanks, James Comey. Uh, and that's that's how it turned out. The perception that polling is wrong and that the polling is always wrong, fine, I tell people, quit looking at polls. Oh, that's right, you can't. You can't quit looking at polls because you you want the info, you're desperate for the knowledge, and if you're a partisan, so what did Repo- Republicans were, every poll that came out, Republicans said one of two things. Either this poll is wrong because it does not say that we're going to win everything, or this poll says we're going to win everything. Those are the only two. These are the only two kinds of polls that Republicans could see. It will be well into 2023 before I can eat all the steak dinners that I won from Republicans uh, last week. So your prediction was similar to mine. I was R plus two in the Senate, R plus 25 in the House, and just you know landed on those to be definitive. I felt like I was a little bit wrong because you know I was predicting the higher end of things. But you mentioned the national. Soul searching. You also mentioned how state level polls can show you a direction. And you mentioned how polls are accurate, the good ones. We just don't know which way they are going to shift. So during this national soul searching, has there been any new type of metrics or any combination of metrics that, as election consumers or even as people working on these campaigns, that we can? consume together to get a better feel of how the polls might be wrong rather than just looking at polls. And specifically, Chris, to give 
an analogy to our listeners. I'm a big baseball fan. I played in college baseball. Oh, nice. There, there was a revolution with Moneyball, right? Oh, everybody wants the sabermetrics of politics. Everybody <laughs> wants the sabermetrics of politics. Even to like simplify it for the audience, there's ERA, earned run average, which used to be the gold standard, and batting average. And now there's just more advanced statistics that you can take in combination with, de- with each other, which Moneyball folks would say... Uh, is more important and more predictive. Do we have that in in politics and polling? Or well, I don't even think you have it in baseball. I think that the I, I think that the people crave certainty, right? They crave certainty. We have the 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 no the foolproof system that will deliver the results every time, and we've got it, and it's here. And our craving for that certitude allows us to believe things that we wouldn't normally believe. Um, and we had a real problem in the United States. We, we love the data, right? We love the data. Oh, if we just had enough data, then we would know everything. Well, you won't. Um, and as a person who has devoted his professional life to uh, cephology, um, I can tell you, there's always going to be surprises, and that's okay. That's okay that there's always going to be surprises. The problem that we're experiencing right now is related to the fact that the parties have made their focus to delegitimize the other party, right? So the, the we have such a high degree of negative partisanship that partisans' primary function is to delegitimize the other side. So whatever majority exists is always an illegitimate majority. If it's a Republican majority, it was one because it's racist or because of uh, bad things that Glenn Youngkin said about CRT, or it has to be immoral or illegitimate in some way. If it's a Democratic victory, they stole it uh, with rigged, but that they're, they're not legitimately this way because neither party wants to admit that these days, basically the reason I'm the only reason anybody ever wins an election is because voters find the opponent to be more unacceptable, right? To be uh, more disgusting. The Republicans this cycle thought they were going to benefit from the what I call the Mickey Mouse balloon effect. So normally you squeeze one ear of a Mickey Mouse balloon, what happens? The other one expands. The other ear gets bigger, right? Those voters go somewhere and say, oh, the Democrats, nobody likes the Democrats. Squeeze the ear. Other ear is supposed to get bigger. And Republicans are like, our ear is going to get so big. We're going to win 40 seats. It's going to be fantastic. Here it comes. And what voters did this time was they grabbed both ears, right? They said, I don't like either of you. You guys are rotten and we don't like you. And it's very much what we saw in the 2016 election. It's very much what we saw in the 2020 election. Uh, 2018 was a more typical kind of midterm. Voters snapped hard against the party in power. But Democrats took the wrong lesson from that, that somehow their moment, the progressive democratic socialist moment had arrived. So we just have a couple of parties that for obvious reasons cannot rationally assess what's going on. Yeah. I've been making a point on some of our recent programs about how people are misunderstanding approval ratings, kind of along the lines of what you're saying, Chris, because we're used to seeing approval ratings that really can vary wildly going up and down, up and down. And um, we assume sometimes when we see a low number, that it reflects positively on the opposition. Right. But instead, what we're seeing now are overall approval ratings just trending downwards for all of our institutions. You know, the Supreme Court has, I think, for the first time ever, a negative approval rating. Yeah. Even I think the military, which has usually been the most popular institution, is going. How do you have a how do you have a Congress that always says, like, you know, they'll see this Congress new approval rating, 15 percent. People are mad at Congress. And I say, oh, yes, but Congress also has a 97 percent incumbency retention rate. Yeah. So tell me about that one. You know, and the, the I call it the bean dinner phenomenon, which is the people say, well, what do you how do you think of the job Congress? Ah, oh, they're terrible. What do you think about the job that the Republican Party? Oh, they're terrible. Too. Oh, I hate those guys. OK, well, what about your Republican congressman? Oh, I like him. I met him at a bean dinner and he is OK. He <laughs> gave a talk and I like him. He if only they could all be that way. In my book, something I talk a lot about uh, is fundamental attribution error the social psychological phenomenon by which when somebody from our group does something wrong, we know that they had a good reason for doing it. 
And if somebody from another group does something wrong, it is only proof that that's how they are, right? You know how they are. This is just them being themselves. And so if you think about it, how, you know, back to the question about polling, you know how Gallup used to do its polls in the 40s and early 50s? They would stop people on the street until they had talked to what they thought was a pretty good number, representative number, then they'd publish a poll. Wow. So like <laughs> Dewey, Dewey defeats Truman. Now, in, in that race, by the way, I will point out, they stopped polling, Gallup stopped polling because Dewey was so far ahead. They stopped polling like a month out. But polling is supposed to be like, well, here's some interesting stuff we saw if you want to know. Here, here's an interesting thing. Here's what's going on. But if you see the election, if you see the outcome of an election as the future of American democracy and the fate of the republic hinges on which nerd from Wolf Knuckle for the second district of Pennsylvania's Wolf Knuckle district, that who <laughs> wins that seat, this will decide whether America lives or not. The way people understand polling is and the way people understand the coverage of politics is is not going to work, right? Because it's not just like, I, I'm supposed to be like the weatherman. Hey guys, here's some interesting stuff. There's an election coming up. Here's kind of the way the winds are blowing. Here's what the polls say. Here's what the other thing, here's what history says. It's interesting. Um, but if you if you believe that the future of the country hinges on keeping other people out of power, you're not going to be able to look at polls correctly. You're not going to be able to look at public sentiment correctly. Well, let me ask you this then, Chris, you're talking about how coverage of the election standings and the polls can be really interesting and entertaining to watch. And I totally agree. There's also, you know, you can make a case for the real value in that kind of coverage because it helps people build expectations about future events. And those expectations are relevant. I mean, the way that you invest money, the way that uh, you might adjust your own public policy in your state or, or so on. I mean, that's going to be impacted by who you are expecting to win the election. So it's not pure entertainment. That's a that's a very generous rationalization that I'm going to rely on in the future. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm trying to do as best as I can to kind of uh, ask this in a balanced way. And, and you know where I'm going here. We do see so much criticism of what's called a horse race coverage. And how do you find the right balance? I mean, how much time should we spend talking about substance and policy? And how much time should we spend talking about elections and how we expect they're going to turn out and how the candidates are performing on the trail? The politicoification of American politics, uh, which was supercharged by the arrival of Twitter, reframed discussions. The idea that you could win the day, right? That concept, and this is before your time, but Politico used to talk about winning the day. Who won the day? It's like, well, you can't win the day. You can win the election, but you can't win the day. And there's no, it's like in a relationship. And I don't know whether you guys, what your relationship statuses are, but there is no bank, right? There's no like, if you're good and you do the, it's not like then the next day in a relationship you wake and you're like, yeah, but today I don't have to do anything because I did all that good stuff yesterday. There's no bank. And when we talk about politics, if we see winning, as good a reason good enough. Um, what is the ultimate rationale as Republicans are having their debate right now about Donald Trump? What are they really talking about? They're not having a moral conversation. They're having a conversation about, can we win with him? Uh, can we win without him? How can we win? And I'm okay with that for the parties because the parties, like the purpose of the Pittsburgh Steelers is not to run the wishbone offense purpose of the Pittsburgh Steelers is to win football games, right? So I assume parties are going to act in a rationally self-interested way. Now, of course, we have some bad inputs here that rational self, and we, we have a lot of perverse incentives. So rational self-interest can lead the country to some bad places. But I understand why parties look at these questions the way that they do. But if it is good enough to say that you did something bad to win, and both parties do it, right? Uh, Joe Biden knows that the demagoguery that he is engaged in has not been helpful, right? It has not been helpful except for one thing. It helped the, it, uh, one of the verdicts of the 2022 election was that Joe Biden did have the right message 
uh, for winning the election, which was to say, these Republicans are crazy. They're crazy. And they're a threat to democracy. And you can't vote for them. Now, that wasn't necessarily long term. That's not necessarily long term good for the country because you're using that you're using the, the chasm, you're deepening the chasm in order to get through this next election. And both parties have this problem, right? Well, we just got to get through. We, we just got to get through this one. And then after this, we're going to go straight, right? We're going to clean up. We're going to do it the right way after this, but we got to get through this one. I think um, horse race coverage is like um, fantasy football. So fantasy football and now sports gambling have made the NFL a lot more interesting for a core set of users, right? But in its own way, it ruins the game, right? Because fantasy football, that's, that's for me, not an enjoyable way to consume football, right? I don't want to watch NFL Red Zone and be clicking through all day to see, like, my son. Okay, my, this running back did this. I want, to, I want to know, did the Steelers win or lose? That's what I want to know. Um, and I think horse race coverage, when it descends into minutia like that, uh, can lose um, – can lose – not just lose, but defeat uh, the moral and philosophical components that are supposed to animate political discussion. So I want to make an illustration for you here, Chris. You're talking about how the Republican Party are doing the wrong thing for their own self-interest. And I think from their perspective, they believe that they're making a Faustian bargain, right? The right. deal with the devil. But in this last election – we're seeing how it might be less of a Faustian bargain and perhaps more like the monkey's paw that, (laughs) you know, they're making the deal, but they're not even really getting what they want in the end. Anyway, it's a lose, lose, you know, the Faustian bargain is still a curse. It's still the wrong thing to do. And we learned that from the story. Yeah, You do end up in hell at the end. (laughs) Yeah. But at least you get what you want. And in the monkey's paw, they don't really get what they want either. And I think that's maybe what Kevin McCarthy and Rick Scott and the rest of them have learned from this outcome. Doing the wrong thing can lead to the the outcome you don't want. I love Rick Scott's chutzpah. This is a guy, (laughs) this is like, this is a guy who gets his ass handed to him. And he's like, and you know what? And I'm running for Republican leader. And I I like it because it's it's the most brazen way to be like, what defeat? I don't know what you're talking about, defeat. This is awesome. And it's very Trumpy, right? You never admit defeat. You never say that you lost. You never say that you were wrong. You know, Rick Scott, I don't understand it because who would want that job? Not that he could get it, but who would want that job? Uh, Number one. Number two, he's rich, right? He's super (laughs) rich and he's been governor of Florida. And if what you do for a living makes you have to say some ridiculous stuff like that and why, I mean, why not take advantage of the fact that you're rich and old and you've had a successful life and be able to say something like, you know what? You're right. I blew it. That was bad. <laughs> and you don't have to say it in all those terms, but just take a little responsibility for what went on and move on. And it's okay. And by the way, the voters of Florida will never know or care or remember. No one has ever won or lost a Senate seat on the basis of, well, I found his performance in the midterms uh, <laughs> leading an organization I've never heard of to be unsatisfactory. And I think that the remarks that Kevin Kramer made, no, none of that uh, has any real political effect. This is about pridefulness. And the Republicans in 2020 were denied the opportunity to do what you're supposed to do after a loss, which is take inventory and make a decision. What did the Republicans conclude after 2012? Oh, the autopsy. What did they conclude? Well, no, no, no. Not what the Republican National Committee concluded, which was younger, more diverse, da 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 It was like, or, oh, oh let's, let's go back it's just to, to show how routine this is. After 2004, when Democrats lost their minds, could not believe that George W. Bush war criminal cowboy, has possibly been reelected president by a wider margin than he was the first time. And this is, they were really, so they said, okay, what are we going to do? And they did an unofficial, an unofficial autopsy took place for the Democratic Party in 2004. And they said, we're getting killed on God, guns, and gays. 
And we need a red state Democrat. And Hillary Clinton was on that list. We need a red state Democrat. Uh, Mark Warner was on that list. There was this short list of like, got to get back to a Clintonian kind of NASCAR dad energy. You know what no one said? How about the most liberal member of the Senate? He's a freshman. His middle name is Hussein. He just got elected on anti-war policy. No one would have said, this is correct. This is the guy. So what happens after an election is parties, and when I say parties, there is no such thing as the party decides old-fashioned thing anymore. There's an ongoing convention that's taking place in the media and on social media for the next two years, right? Among Republicans, who do we really like? Oh, who, you know, which Facebook, <laughs> which Facebook channel uh, is, is blazing, um, or I'm sorry, bussing. And that's, that's what, that's, that is the same thing as a convention. It's just taking place among millions of people around the country, but they're coming to a decision. And the decision Democrats reached after 2004 was not that they need somebody who is more boring than John Kerry, but they 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 went for some they went for the opposite of John Kerry in a lot of ways. Republicans after 2012 went for the opposite of Mitt Romney. He is a businessman, but it's the opposite. He's not nice, right? And he's not conciliatory. Did you ever see the video of Mitt Romney uh, when he, they gave him the birthday cake made out of Twinkies because he loves Twinkies? I have not seen that. He went through and he took out each candle from the cake and blew it out individually. <laughs> So that he would not, he said he had been feeling a little poorly in recent days and did not want, he wanted everybody to be able to enjoy it. So he took each candle out. And blew what a it. nice guy. Donald Trump would not do that. Right? He would lick the cake. He would hock a loogie <laughs> and he would say, what do you bring me? This this cake is crap with just Twinkies. Who wants this? It's very sad. But Republicans chose the opposite of Mitt Romney. They wanted a totally different energy. So this time, what should have, what in a normal cycle would happen would be Republicans would say that was weird. Right. Uh, so we should do something else. We lost an election. We should do something else, but they weren't allowed to admit that they lost the election. So they couldn't go through what they're starting to go through. Now, this is the loss for Republicans that is triggering the autopsy, uh, that's taking place. And I don't know whether it's better or worse to have it happen in a, in so close to actually choosing, but that's how they're going to do it. So you mentioned 2012, and that makes sense. In 2014, I went to want to work with one of the leaders of the Tea Party, Tim Heelskamp, and he, you know, was proud of orchestrating or helping to orchestrate the overthrow of John Boehner, and, and that moves us into. Well, did they overthrow John Boehner? I don't think. I don't think that's the phrase I would use. Oh, well, well, sorry, sorry. Um, where they voted him out of the speakership? I would say that what happened was John Boehner took a long drag off of a Terryton cigarette. Drinking some wine. Had a glass of Merlot. And he was like, <laughs> hey, chuckleheads, guess what? I'm out. And he took, and he, and he took the, uh, it, it was the, you remember the, uh, t- the tweet that John Boehner posted on like the day when I forget what horrible task of cleaning the Augean stables that Paul Ryan was engaged in. It was like, one of these days you're like, oh man, it's bad up there. And it was the first tweet from John Boehner post speakership. And it was a picture of him standing in his front lawn in suburban Cincinnati with the with his white tube socks pulled up to his calves and uh, with his Toro lawnmower. And it said, a great a perfect day for the first cut of springtime. And it was, <laughs> of course, the message to Paul Ryan and the Republicans was like, enjoy it, dummies. Have a good time. I'm I'm happy out here. Boehner, what Boehner did was what Kevin McCarthy could never dream of doing right now. Maybe one day Kevin McCarthy will get there. But what Boehner did was he said, if I do this, I can't stay a speaker anymore. And he said, I'm ready to not be speaker anymore, right? I'm ready to not be speaker. So so this is a very John Boehner and retelling from my experience of what happened on the inside. And I say this as somebody that's now a Democrat. A moderate Democrat, albeit a Joe Manchin Democrat, a Chris Sununu supporter. But from my experience, uh, and this is largely why they changed the rules. Speaker Pelosi changed the rules of the House to remove the ability of, you know, rank and file members to invoke the motion to vacate the chair. 
which is essentially my understanding. The Tea Party Caucus, the House Freedom Caucus would go to these meetings at Tortilla Coast, which were a bunch of fun to go to. It would be your usual characters of Mick Mulvaney, uh, Mark Meadows, my former boss, Tim Hulescamp, Jim Jordan, and Ted Cruz was actually the ringleader. And at some point, you you had this little faction of rabble rousers, the Justin Amash, the Tim Hulescamp, the folks that Banner kicked off their committees. And they always wanted to get rid of John Banner. He called them legislative terrorists, and they would go down with the ship. They would yeah, do yeah. something potentially that would have a, a Democrat speaker. But but essentially, long story short, those folks coalesced a group of 30 others to, to 40 others to maintain uh, unity during the motion to vacate. And ultimately, they forced him out. And then, if you remember, M- McCarthy was going to com- become oh, speaker. Oh, yes, but- I do. Be- oh, because I this group, do. <laughs> because this group was so strong, they all followed Walter Jones's infamous letter um, that ultimately prevented Kevin McCarthy from becoming the speaker at the time. So my question is, you're saying this grand soul searching is going to take place. And John and I debate about this ad nauseum. So maybe you can help settle this for us. And I, and I have a feeling we might disagree, Chris. All right. My view is that ultimately... What helped uh, Donald Trump prevail was the sentiment from these Tea Party members across the the 40 different districts, the structure of the Republican presidential primary, which is the way that I view it. Again, I'm biased. I worked at the RNC during this election and then uh, for for my former member. I view the the energy is the coin of the realm, even in a presidential primary at the state level. And the energy ultimately comes from the fanatics. So think of Game of Thrones and that religious fanatical group that were carving the circles in their foreheads. So I ultimately think that even if they want to get rid of President Trump and even if they want to do a soul searching, there is still 36 members, 37 members in the House Freedom Caucus, which is near its height. It is still a very powerful powerful caucus. So these guys have supporters. You're telling me that that this doesn't matter and that Trump won't be able to break through in a primary? That is not what I said at all. That is (laughs) in no way a representation of anything that I said. I thought you were going off the soul searching. Why did John Boehner have to leave? Why did did John Boehner have to leave? Because of the chuckleheads. Yeah, that's why he had to leave. That is why he had to leave. He had to leave because it was like, all right, we got another one of these dumb continuing resolutions that we're going to do. And it's it's a bad way to run the government. But here we go again. And it was like, not this time, sir. And Banner was like, you know what? Suck it. Uh, I'm done. We could go through another government shutdown. We could go through another round of this stuff. But you know what? We're blowing up the Hastert rule and we're going to jam this thing through. And I'm leaving and I'm done. And you all can just do it. And there's Kevin McCarthy like, finally. My precious, I'm going to have it. And then for a variety of reasons, uh, it is taken away from him. Well, one reason. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to traffic in any gossip or whatever, but there were there were reasons that uh, yeah. he, he did not obtain the speakership. And then Paul Ryan says, okay, I'll do it if you beg. If you, if you beg, I'll do it. And so they say, okay, fine, we'll do it. And by that point, the Freedom Caucus had, was excited not to get McCarthy, which of course shows what they know. They would have been much better off to have McCarthy, who is, who is pliant. Uh, they would have been much better off to have had McCarthy, but they, but somehow Ryan, because of his fiscal conservatism, and you know, it, he became more acceptable to more of them, and he got through. So now, the biggest winners of this election. So the twenty twenty two election, best and worst, best. We did it. There were no screw ups. There were no problems. We'll see what Carrie Lake does, but there were whatever, right? Democracy did not crumble. Good. Uh, We need to get states to have better mail in ballot laws. That would be super helpful if we could get the Western states to move up there. You don't need two weeks. Shouldn't, Shouldn't require two weeks to conduct an election. And I understand that that's not fraud and I shouldn't, that, that, that that's not, that, that that doesn't mean something bad has happened, but for the sake of keeping people from stealing elections, it would be really helpful if we could go ahead and get a more decisive result when the election is over. So we need to get states to agree 
to have the ballots be returned by election day. Just give people as long, start mailing them out whenever you want, but get them in so that we can have a count and not have these weird periods where we're uncertain because that's definitely not good to have in 2024. So the system worked, that's good. Number two, the good news is that there was no consensus, right? There was no, nobody has a mandate. Neither party, the Democrats lost and Republicans vastly underperformed. So nobody walks out of this like, we did it, they love us. The, the, the correct and clear message from the electorate came through. We don't like either of these choices and we're gonna just, we're gonna have to pick our way through this minefield to do it. That's the downside. What's the upside? Or, what, or that's the upside, what's the downside? The people who most want to ruin our republic, right, who believe that the republic is so rotten that it must be basically felled, uh, have been empowered dramatically. And they have been empowered because what Kevin McCarthy hoped and believed, I'm sure, was that it's not going to be 15 to 25. It's going to be 25 to 45. We're going to win everything. It's going to happen everywhere. These numbers are going to be huge. I mean, again, these Republicans were telling me crazy numbers, crazy numbers. You can put New Hampshire in the bank, New Hampshire Senate's in the bank, Patty Murray within five. I'm like, I don't know, guys. I'm not seeing anything like that. Um, and the reason, though, McCarthy needed those numbers was that who gets elected in a wave? Moderates. That's who gets elected in a wave because they get elected from suburban swing districts. That's where they come from. And those members would have been a huge help to McCarthy in keeping the Freedom Caucus in line. Well, now the Freedom Caucus, by the way, which celebrated its return to Washington with a dinner uh, with the guest of honor, Tucker Carlson, I don't think is in a mood to moderate. And it, they shouldn't. Practically speaking, they shouldn't because they've never been more powerful. They own the speaker. Uh, or the, the the prospective speaker, and they have set the standard. I mean, by the time we got to the point of Kevin McCarthy sucking up to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Thank you. You're like, you know, was it worth it, homie? Like, was this, was was it, was it, was the, was it, was the juice worth the squeeze? And, I can't wait to see what she got. And, and he's got to give it to, whatever he said he was going to give her, he's got to give it to her because they are in the majority. Whether it's by five seats or 50 uh, they're in the majority. And if, if I'm Joe Biden, I'm looking at this and I'm saying I got everything I wanted. Thank you. That I was talking to my friends on the Fetterman campaign, on uh, the campaign that uh, defeated Joe Kent and a, and a bunch of others. And I was like, this is the perfect outcome. My progressives wanted the, my progressive friends wanted the house. I'm like, no, no, no. I lived through a house like this. This is what you want if you're a Democrat. But I wanted to follow up and then we'll pivot to, to a different topic right here. You mentioned the soul searching and you mentioned that this would be the election for the Republicans to do it if they could. My premise of the case is they can't and Donald Trump's going to be the nominee. Is that flawed? Do you have a different theory of the case? Will soul searching happen and will they move to somebody else? Or is the party reshaped in the image of the man, i.e. the Freedom Caucus, where the primary structure is just not good for moving on from a uh, cultist who has, you know, 35% stranglehold on the, on the voters. I think it's more dynamic. I think it's more dynamic than that. There are 30% of Republicans, something like that, who are always Trump. They love him. They love him. They love him. He is either God's instrument uh, come to rede redeem a fallen nation uh, or they just think it's good TV and they just love the guy. They just think he's hilarious and they think he's great. And they just, they like him for him. Then there's like 10% of Republicans, 15% of Republicans who are never Trump. No, nope, not even in a general election, no matter what, I hate this guy, no way. And that number of course shrinks over time. Why? Because those people leave the Republican party, they become independents, they, they drift away. But the plurality of Republicans are always Republican right? They'll vote for Donald Trump in a general election again. Sure, because they're not going to vote for a Democrat. But that doesn't mean that that's their preferred setting. And Donald Trump in 2024 is not the same as Donald Trump in 2015, right? Um, much has transpired. And I refer to him now as the MAGA Jeb Bush. He's overfunded. He's got too much baggage, too many priors to drag around, too much to defend. 
When Donald Trump ran for president the first time, he didn't have to defend anything. He was new every morning. There was no need for consistency. There's nothing to defend. Uh, did I support the Iraq war? Did I oppose the Iraq war? I don't know, but George Bush should have been impeached and we should have stolen the oil. Blah, like just out there. So here's Donald Trump, who has been the cause of three successively bad cycles for Republicans, 2018, 2020, and 2022. And he's got to defend those cycles. Okay. He's got to defend, uh, trying to steal the election. He's got to defend the cuckoo choose who he has championed. He's got to defend the Carrie Lakes of the world or the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world because he can't just now cut them off because he, there is this universe, right? And his son and other acolytes have built this, have turned the cult of personality into a business and a church and, and, and this institution that exists and has a life of its own. So it demands to be serviced. So I just think, you know, Trump is the front runner, I would say, for the Republican nomination. But as Ron DeSantis has already illustrated, the Republican Party would prefer to not nominate Donald Trump again. If the Republican Party does nominate Donald Trump again, the 80 percent of its members will vote for him in the general election for sure. They probably lose the general election. Um, but one thing I would say to Democrats as they're rooting today for Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee, I would say to them, shame, shame, shame on you. Uh, the fact that Democrats work to defeat people like Peter Meyer, congressman from Michigan. Uh, We've had him on the show. The, the fact that, that Democrats uh, propped up people like Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania, it's gross, right? You can't, be, you can't say out of the, in the same breath that democracy is dying and then – help people who are uh, doing the very wickedness that you uh, say is killing the country, you can't then prop them up. So the problem for the Democrats need to process is it's not that Trump would surely lose. It's that he might well win. And that's a, that's, that's, that's a country that reelects a person to the presidency who tried a self coup is not the mark of a healthy Republican. So, Chris, I want to ask you about a story that we've been seeing over the last 24 hours that's connected to Trump's supposed campaign relaunch. And that's that Rupert Murdoch has allegedly spoken to Trump and told him that my media empire, my network and my newspapers are not going to support you. We're going to actively oppose you. You think who's, who reported that? Uh, who was it? I, I think it might have been a UK outlet. Justin, do you have the outlet name right now? It was a UK outlet. I can... I can pull that up. What I wanted to get your help with was explaining to us and to the audience what that even really means inside a media organization. How practically does the view of an owner or CEO make its way on air? What's the dynamic? I don't believe that story. One percent. I don't have one (laughs) percent confidence in a, a report from the British press that Rupert Murdoch called up Donald Trump and was like, See here now, we're not doing it anymore with you. No, I don't think that happened at all. I I reject the premise of the question. Okay. Let me explore an aspect of what I was trying to learn from you though, Chris, which is inside a media organization, how does, even if it's not this view, but how do the views of the ownership team end up getting reflected on air? I mean, is there a process through which that actually happens? Well, every place is different and every place has different aspirations. Um, Every newsroom that I've worked in is different. Um, What you're looking for, of course, is um, you're looking for independence. That's what you want as a journalist. You want to basically be left alone. Um, And I can say that in my years at Fox, uh, I was never asked to say something I didn't think was true. And that was, uh, we were very lucky. We worked in the Washington Bureau and it was great. Um, we were removed from a lot of the bad stuff. We would later uh, find out included some pretty shocking stuff on the human resources front uh, that was going on in New York. Uh, so that was the, those years at Fox were great. Um, but uh, so was my time at the Washington Examiner. And so I, I guess what I would say is if you have a leader, if you, and of course, if you have an owner, is different than a publisher or an editor or a managing editor. 
if you put your thumb on the scale too hard, it doesn't work. You can't get good journalists. You can't get, you can't be a good product if you're putting your thumb on the scale. Now, a lot of what happens at news outlets are the um, perceived shibboleths. Um, somebody says something one time in a meeting at some point about somebody liking or not. So let's say it's like, uh, what would it be? Let's say somebody really, in, in a meeting some point, some boss is like, I hate my little pony. And then somehow for the rest of all time, it's like, what? And then you say, well, you walk out in the newsroom, and you're like, why do we have five hit pieces on my little pony going on? It's like, well, you know, Dan said in that meeting before Christmas, how much he hates my little pony. And, and everybody now says, if you do pro pony work, you're going to get in trouble. And everybody knows it. And managers start enforcing it as if it was doctrine. So Chris, it's like uh, Henry the second, Will someone rid me of this troublesome priest? Pestilent priest is how I learned it, but yes, that's cool. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to remember in the movie how Peter O'Toole said it, but um, that's basically the dynamic that you're describing. There's that There's that component. Now, sure, there are places where they do put the thumb on the scale, right? They come in and say, this is how we're doing it. This is how it's going to be. But I, look, I mean, I don't know. I, I, like I say, I don't watch Fox, uh, not out of, I just don't, but I don't watch much TV news anyway. Uh, but I can tell you that at the, in the news pages of the Wall Street Journal, if they came in and said to the reporters, okay, it's all positive DeSantis coverage from now on, that wouldn't work. They would lose the Wall Street Journal. So I just encourage people, take your media bit by bit, be specific and be uh, selective is what I would say. That's interesting because so my former boss at the RNC, I don't need to name him, is I think now an SVP at Fox News. And what I did was opposition research during the 2016 election. And our job was essentially to create talking points that mm, weren't really true, but we were taking information and using facts and taking those facts, distorting the truth, taking them out of context, and then sending them to our surrogates, sending them to mainstream outlets, and obviously also outlets like Free Beacon, Fox News. And what we were told by this gentleman who is now working for Fox News is... Can you say who it is? Yeah, Raj Shah. Oh, okay. Sure. He was the RNC research director. So my experience was we were under the understanding that when it needed to be done, Fox would essentially run a lot of our content wholesale. And we would we would see this content come up um, on coverage, you say My Little Pony. I remember the Melania Trump plagiarizing Michelle Obama speech and the RNC created the My Little Pony talking point. The My Little Pony talking point was, and it was everywhere, this isn't plagiarism. Uh, the line that she used, and it was plagiarism, the line that she used is everywhere, just look, it's in My Little Pony. And that was one of the, the biggest um, forms of defense. I did the Iraq War stuff, so... You did the whole Iraq war? You seem so young. Yeah, I, I was responsible for the invasion of Iraq well and then done. explaining the story. You were just a teen. You were just a teen. Uh, aluminum tubes. <laughs> Yellow cake and you share. Exactly. I guess I would say opposition research. I've accepted plenty of it over the years. Uh, if you have something and it's supportable in it's real and it's a good one, I take it. That's fine. Uh, it, and I'm not under any special obligation when I do. So to all oppo shops, feel free to keep sending it my way. I'm not, uh, there, there's nothing journalistically inappropriate about looking at it. And of course, you say that for the, um, that at the RNC, the knowledge was, and I'm sure, I don't know which producers or which people, but there were people uh, who probably had a good relationship with and knew that you could get an item placed in the same way there's somebody who has somebody at the Washington Post for the Democrats or has something at M MSNBC for them. So I, that stuff doesn't, I don't know, that stuff doesn't bother me too much. The election season getting uh, positive or negative stories placed or spin placed, you can tell the difference. I, I think a, a discerning consumer can tell the difference. The issues are so complex that the news producers we're providing them to are not experts. You say the issues are complicated and whatever else. I think if you're a producer, I think let's let's do it about to be nice. The old CNN morning show, so something that doesn't exist anymore. If you know that you have an audience that is overwhelmingly Democratic, 
and there's an election coming up. What kind of news are you looking for? You're looking for news that's good for Democrats and bad for Republicans. And if the uh, DSCC uh, says, uh, we've got a lovely packet here that talks about why J.D. Vance is a bad person, great. We'll take it. That We'll take all you got. We'll take every, everything that you can. Um, what I think is happening in American media consumption is that people are increasingly aware of the fact that it's not in a good place. Uh, all of the data that I found in my book, uh, found for my book, points me to uh, Americans understanding that our media, to use a terrible phrase, our media ecosystem, uh, is badly, uh, is unwell. And as people consume news, so if you're watching the former CNN morning show and it's all Democrats are good and all Republicans are bad, you discern, a a person who cares to discerns, I'm probably not getting the real news here, right? Much like if you turn on uh, Sean Hannity's show, you're not going to say, I think I'm getting the real stuff. I think I'm getting a real look at this. And... I don't have a, I guess what I would say is we're never going to make it. There's no one who can make it so that all the news and information that is put out there is fair and is well-sourced and all of that stuff. If we think that Americans are competent to choose their own leaders, we had better be at least confident enough that they can figure out how to get news and information. And maybe they can. And I've had far too many opportunities Uh, in recent years to quote Abraham Lincoln's speech at the Young Men's Lyceum more than 20 years before the Civil War. But I hate to break it to everybody that the options that he gave for the United States remain just the same as they were, uh, which is we will either endure for all time as a nation of free men or we will die by suicide. And uh, we can still do that if we want. uh, And we know that how we consume media and what kind of media we consume has consequences for that question. And You know, it's not up to somebody else to stop people from, and I'm not suggesting this is what you were proposing at all, but it's, there's, it's not up to somebody else to make the players in these games, uh, do the right thing. It's up to us as consumers to be smarter and be better. Testing whether a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition all men are created equal can long endure, Chris. We just have to ask you very quickly before you go. We have not even acknowledged your testimony before the historic January 6th committee at all in our conversation. And, you know, the thing that I'm curious about is from your perspective as a person with so much experience on live television, what it's like to appear before a committee like that. I mean, you're used to being watched by millions of people live, but in a context like that one with the pageantry of the United States Congress, is it very different? Well, all the money they paid me to do that. I mean, the huge appearance (laughs) fees that I was working with on that was so much money. I just felt I had to sort of deliver, you know, and they had also met in my writer, the thing about the no green M&Ms in the bowl. They had done everything that I wanted and, you know, whatever, you just got to do. No, I mean, it is not something that I would have asked to do, but it is something that I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did it because what else would I do, right? Would I refuse? Would I demand to be? Somebody said to me, well, you could, you know, you you could say no and tell them that they have to subpoena you and that you won't come voluntarily. I'm like, that seems like a crappy thing to do. That seems pretty bad for me to say that we have to do, we have to make Congress, Congress great again uh, and then say, but I'm going to need to posture publicly that I'm refusing to come, even though I know this is a a duly impaneled body of the Congress and I have to go. So. I have a weird job. I have always had a weird job and I've enjoyed enormously my weird job. I am very fortunate to get to do it.